So welcome to lecture 11.1 of our group theory course. Uh, today we start chapter 11, which is on the applications of group theory to lattice vibrations. We have discussed a few chapters ago applications of, of group theory to molecular vibrations. And um, this is not going to be very much different from in the case of a solid, of, of, uh, of lattice vibrations in a solid. But there are a few uh, important differences, as we're going to point out in a minute. Uh, because in the case of a solid, you have an infinite, uh, supposedly infinite periodic system. And uh, then the wave vector k becomes a, a good quantum number and a label to identify all the the normal modes of, of your system and uh, then we are going to use a mo most of the uh, tools that we have developed uh, in the previous chapter regarding uh, the group of the wave vector that can be applied both for electronic states and for vibrational states. So we start this chapter with a, a brief review on the topic of um, of molecular vibration. Oh, sorry, of uh, lattice vibrations, phonons. Uh, we have discussed some of that regarding molecules, uh, and I think a good starting point is to consider uh, a solid initially like a, a very big molecule, a molecule with uh, 10 to the 23 atoms, something like that. Okay, then uh, if you think in this manner, then you start to think that uh, I may have uh, something like 3n normal modes or 3n degrees of freedom. Uh, of course, in the case of molecules, we had to, to find the number of normal modes, vibrational normal modes. We had to subtract that from that number the three, mode, three degrees of freedom of uh, translation and three degrees of freedom of rotation. But uh, it's, it's for, for a very large number n, this is true, it's still very large. It's like almost 3n, 3n minus 6, right? So it, it, it really doesn't matter this sub, to subtract the, the, the uh, translations and, and, uh, and rotations in this case. And I'm, I'm going to explain in more detail why. But so we have roughly 3n uh, vibrational normal modes. And uh, so once you apply periodic boundary condition, then conditions, then you 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 make a constraint that you cannot have rotations of that molecule anymore. So rotations are irrelevant for for describing this this problem. And um, and all right. So that as I said, uh, k is a good quantum number to label your normal mode. So this is a typical, how a typical uh, normal mode coordinate uh, Q uh, depends on position and on time. <coughs> so um, it's typically normalized by one of the square root of the mass of a given atom and there is this polarization vector. The polarization vector uh, tells me in, in which direction uh, each atom of the unit cell, in this case uh, I label them by the letter tau, in, in which direction they, they, uh, they vibrate for a given normal mode with a wave vector k. So this is a polarization vector. And then there is this uh, uh, oscillatory function, both in time and in space. So the oscillation in time, you see here that this is the frequency of, uh, of the normal mode that usually depends on the wave vector k. So this is the dispersion relation of your system. And the spatial dependence is like a plane wave in which r, r is, a, is a given unit cell vector. Okay. So this is a typical normal mode. This is a review, right? This is a review on your basic uh, uh, 
vibrational properties of solids if you want to review that deeper then all this material is in any uh, solid state or condensed matter physics book okay all right so this is how a typical normal mode look like and let's let 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 us do some examples uh, the simplest case you, you, you may want to consider first is the 1D atomic chain. It's just a chain of atoms in 1D and also the atoms are, are constrained to move in the same in the, this 1D direction. Okay? So you don't have any more 3N degrees of freedom. You have just N degrees of freedom because there's one, just one Cartesian coordinate in this case. And this is a standard problem that uh, that is solved in, in, in analytically in many textbooks. So you have a dispersion relation that looks like that. It's just one mode, uh, sorry, one phonon branch. We we call this a branch. And uh, the first question is, where are the very large number n of n of modes? So uh, in this case, I have n modes, and uh, where are they? So uh, they are in uh, uh, labeled, as I said, by the uh, the uh, wave vector k. So each normal mode corresponds to a, a certain wave vector k, and there is a very fine grid, a very fine grid of. In this case, is I labeled by q, right? But it's the same thing, wave vector. It's a very fine a grid of uh, wave vectors k or q within the first Brillouin zone. Here I'm just showing half of the, the Brillouin zone. There are negative values of, of k here as well. And the thing is, uh, the number of uh, points with, with, within the Brillouin zone, inside the Brillouin zone, is precisely equal to the number of unit cells of your crystal. So I have just n uh, values here corresponding to n atoms but this is a very fine grid so this is just if I consider a periodic solid in one dimension with 10 to the 23 atoms then I have a quasi continuum number of uh, uh, possible values of the wave vector here right and this is the typical this is a, a, a phonon branch a phonon dispersion for a 1D monoatomic crystal <clears throat> All right. So, how do these modes look like in in different places in the Brillouin zone? So, there is a special mode, which is this one, that uh, I have a, a frequency going to zero in the limit of wave vector going to zero, and this is precisely this translation mode. All right. In this case, you see all the atoms are moving by the same amount in the same direction at a given moment in time and this does not correspond to a vibration but it, it corresponds to a translation all right so and that's why i have zero frequency because there is zero restoring force for this mode this is the translation mode and this is what i meant when i i i uh I said that in, in translations are, are not so important as in the case of the molecular solids because in the case of, of uh, sorry, in, they are not as important to, to, to subtract out as in the case of molecules because in the case of solids, they just happen here at a very specific wave vector and it's a kind of analytic continuation of your dispersion. So it's okay to dis re not uh, subtract out the translations. We know what they are. They're just a, a, a very specific uh, mode here in in uh, in the the limit of q going to zero, k going to zero. Okay. So how about uh, the boundary of the Brillouin zone? K equals to pi over a. In the case of k equals to my plus or minus pi over a, then uh, when I uh, when I uh, if you look at this phase factor here, when I travel by uh, lattice constant a, then you see that uh, this inverts the phase. You get a minus sign from this factor. 
So that means that atoms in opposite, sorry, in neighboring, atoms in, in neighboring uh, unit cells, they vibrate with opposite phase. They vibrate against each other, right? So this is a typical uh, mode in the boundary of the Brillouin zone. And you see that in this case, they have the highest frequency, right? And that makes sense because in this case, we have a maximum uh, bone stretching situation in, in which the atoms are vibrating with respect to each other in a position of phase. And for a general K, then you have a, a, a long wavelength modulation of the displacements. And this is, we have an intermediate uh, situation here in terms of the frequency that you can get. Okay, so this is how modes in a 1D chain look like. So in, in most of the calculations we are going to do, uh, uh, we will um, uh, try to find out what are the normal mode displacements, uh, mostly in K equals zero because they are important uh, for infrared and Raman spectroscopy. Why is that the case? Because uh, both pro processes uh, are related to interactions between uh, the vibrations and the photon and, and, and the light, right? And uh, the wave vector of light is, is, is much smaller than the typical wave vector of the Brillouin zone. So when you talk about uh, 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 wavelengths of light are much longer than the typical interspace in, inter, uh, interatomic distance. As this is another way to say the same thing. So, um, so these are the modes that will couple with your vibrations, so the k equals zero or near zero modes. Okay. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so the the second uh, sim most simple case, simplest case, is the case of a diatomic one-dimensional chain. A diatomic one-dimensional chain is uh, represented here. Uh, suppose I have two atoms with masses M1 and M2, different masses. Uh, and uh, now the, your lattice uh, constant is twice as large as before, right? And I have two atoms per unit cell. And when you solve this problem, this also has an analytic solution. Then, as you can expect, now I have two solutions for each value of the wave vector K. Why is that the case? Well, when you do the calculations and you, you transform this into, a res, into um, you Fourier transform your matrix of force constants to, to get the dynamical matrix, then you have a two by two matrix that gives you, for each value of K, gives you two solutions. And these two solutions, they are called the uh, acoustic and optical branches. Uh, sorry, this is in Portuguese. Uh, and uh, they have very different behavior, especially near the k equals zero. F the acoustic branch, uh, and that's precisely the reason it's called the acoustic branch, uh, have zero frequency when in the limit k going to zero, and typically it has a linear, a linear uh, dispersion relation in this limit, omega is equal to c k. And this is precisely the dispersion relation of sound waves. So this, this uh, waves, waves of, of matter are precisely what we call f sound because they are longitudinal waves. Um, in this case, it's, I only have longitudinal waves. So in the case of a 3D solid, then it's gonna be more complicated. But if you consider in this case, I have a longitudinal waves uh, with a linear dispersion, and this is precisely uh, sound for in the limit of large, uh, large wavelengths, small wave vectors. Okay, but for small for uh, k equals zero, I have another solution here that also has some dispersion as I move away from k equals zero, and this is called the optical branch. And uh, 
and I can see here the the mode displacement for all these different branches. The the acoustic for k equals zero is precisely again the translation mode, and the optical mode at k equals zero is that particular mode in which the atoms move in a position of, of phase uh, uh, between nearest neighbors, right? And uh, why is it called optical mode? Because if you have a polar crystal, an ionic crystal, in which, for instance, these two different atoms with different masses, they also have opposite charges, plus and minus charge, let's imagine. You can see that precisely this is the mode that's going to couple strongly with the electromagnetic field with photons, right? Because the electric field of light will uh, make these this charges uh, move into op opposite directions. And that's, that's the reason why it's called the optical mode, okay? And then in the boundary of the Brillouin zone, you have uh, two modes. Now the distinction between optical and acoustic is not so important but you can see that you can have two solutions here in which in one solution uh, the mass M2 moves and M1 uh, stands still and in the other solution M1 moves and M2 stands still so that corresponds to these different solutions here at the boundary of the Brillouin zone separated by a gap All right. So this is a brief review on the the, the uh, vibrational properties of solid and to, to finalize this review just let's let me show you how things look when we go 3D when you, we go three dimension so when you go three dimensional uh, I, I have uh, 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 as we've seen here the number of um, branches in the first Brillouin zone is proportional is equal to sorry is proportional to the number of atoms per unit cell right and it's also proportional to the to the dimensionality of space right because uh, here I had two two branches because this is a 1d problem if it this was a 2d problem I would have six uh, six branches three times two Okay, so the number of branches that I, I have is precisely that. It's precisely the number of, of uh, atoms within our primitive unit cell times the dimensionality of space. In, in most cases, I, I will uh, have three dimensional systems. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's just uh, three times the number of atoms within the first uh, a, a primitive unit cell. And this is an example for germanium. Germanium has two atoms per unit cell. Uh, it's the diamond structure. And you see that precisely uh, we have, uh, you can see it here, it's more clear. So uh, along the gamma, a gamma K direction in the Brillouin zone, I have one, two, three, four, five, six different solutions. Okay. Uh, you see that uh, in, in along certain directions they are uh, uh, they are degenerate, so you don't see all of them most of the time, and they also become degenerate at the gamma point. So this is a threefold degenerate. This is a threefold degenerate state, and you have a, when you go away from the gamma point, compatibility relations tells us. Uh, how uh, uh, different symmetries, how they split, uh, we're going to see that in a minute. Uh, and uh, for instance, a gamma 1, 5 mode, it splits into a delta 5 plus delta 1. This is doubly degenerate, this is non-degenerate. And uh, a gamma 2, 5 prime mode splits into a, a delta 2 prime plus delta 5. Okay. And also, in this case, there is this distinction between uh, uh, longitudinal and, uh, and uh, transverse modes. So, this non-degenerate mode is the, what we call LA, longitudinal acoustic mode, and this is a TA, transverse acoustic mode. Uh, and the, the distinction is that for longitudinal modes, 
let's say this is the wave vector for longitudinal modes uh, the displacements are along the same uh, direction as the wave vector so this is an LA mode and for transverse acoustic modes is the opposite right so if there is a wave uh, length uh, 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 let's suppose this is some sort of uh, uh, represents a plane wave so this this is a, a trans uh, Transverse acoustic mode, suppose again the, the wave vector is along this direction. So the atoms have uh, the, the degree of freedom of uh, oscillating uh, either uh, in the same direction of a wave vector or in perpendicular direction. So you have two perpendicular directions, so that's why you have two TA modes and just one longitudinal direction, so that's why you have one LA mode. And the same thing for optical modes. So this is a 2D transverse optical mode, TO, and this is a not 2D, two-fold degenerate. And this is a non-degenerate uh, longitudinal optical mode. All right. So let's now discuss uh, how group theory can help us in uh, finding out or, or learning more about the uh, normal mode vibrations of our system and this is a general rule a general outline or recipe to calculate or to to use group theory to calculate uh, different uh, properties of vibrational modes in a solid let me go through all that so what we do first first as always, you find the symmetry operations of the group of the wave vector at k equals 0. So initially we consider k equals 0. It's important to consider that first. And the reason, again, is because of uh, that those are the most important modes regarding infrared and Raman spectroscopy. So we find out what is the group of the wave vector at k equals 0 and then the appropriate character table and irreducible representations. All right. Next, you find uh, you find the equivalence representation, right? That we discussed last time, <clears throat> and you find the representation for lattice modes as the direct product between the equivalence representation and the vector representations. Okay, and as I said, we do not have to subtract uh, rotations and translations in this case and let me be more specific about that in a minute <clears throat> then uh, in general this is going to be a reducible representation and we decompose that into irreducible representations as, well, as usual then we can find the normal mode patterns either using projection operators or or physical intuition and then from the symmetry of the modes we find which modes are infrared and raman active and their polarization effects and then you repeat all of that <coughs> for if you want for uh, away from the gamma point for k different than zero okay and after we do that, you can join uh, the lines and using compatibility relations to connect the, the phonon branches, and uh, and that's it. So that's our general recipe for uh, using group theory to study <coughs> vibrational properties of solids. Um, so again, let me just one more time emphasize. Uh, and call your attention to some differences uh, between the 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 case of molecular vibrations that we have studied before and the case of lattice modes that we study now um, the first important difference is uh, regarding 
the issue of uh, eigenvectors and normal modes. So this is just to say that uh, eigenvectors of uh, your now your your dynamical matrix are going to be the the normal modes displacements of your system uh, and this is is just the same as in molecules but when you go is just the same as in molecules uh, for for k equals zero but when you go for away from k equals zero for k different than zero you have to be careful because there's going to be this phase factor e to the i k dot r between that uh, the re that is the relative phase between uh, uh, two atoms vibrations which are separated by a uh, 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 unit cell vector or, or uh, a, brevet, a, a lattice vector r okay so when we study um, normal modes away from k equals zero you we must be careful um, with that all right and and remember just one more time for k equals zero is the most important case that's when we're going to look at the infrared and raman activity All right. Another important thing is uh, f to find, we have discussed that in the previous chapter, to find the equivalence representation, we must consider uh, the situation in, in which when, when you apply some symmetry operation, P of alpha, into a certain uh, atom, it goes into another atomic position and but if it goes into an atomic position which is, represents just a displacement by a, a, a lattice vector r then this is considered equivalent so not only atoms that are mapped into themselves but also atoms which are mapped into themselves up to a lattice vector translation are going to be considered equivalent okay and finally uh, this is what I, I had discussed already in the case of molecules in the case of molecules the um, the representation for molecular vibrations was equal to the uh, equivalence or atom sites representation and direct product with a vector minus the translations minus the rotations now in the case of solids we call it with a different name lattice modes and the difference is just that uh, I just multiply I make the direct product between that and the the vector and I don't have to subtract the translations and and the rotations okay uh, for the reasons I have explained already and the number of branches I have I have said that already but then let me just uh, write it here the number of branches of phonon branches is uh, for a three-dimensional systems or for a d-dimensional systems the dimensionality of the space times the number of atoms per unit cell primitive unit cell and this is very important I have to work always with the primitive and not the conventional unit cell okay all right very good so let's do some examples so 
uh, I think the remainder of this chapter is just uh, a bunch of examples. So let me start with this uh, one of the simplest cases. Here's the sodium chloride, the sodium chloride structure. It's uh, very well known. This is the sodium chloride, and uh, it's a cubic structure. It has an FCC Brevet lattice. And uh, this is a notation for the space group in two different notations. It is a, and you see the, the sodium chloride has an FCC lattice and two atoms per unit cell. And you can think of one sodium atom at one particular position that we can call the origin and one chlorine atom displaced by a certain uh, a certain a certain uh, vector that I can call tau but this is a symorphic structure right because there are no symmetry operations that uh, take one atom uh, to another, then there are no symmetry operations that take sodium to chlorine. So that's that's a symorphic uh, structure. Okay. All right. So this is sodium chloride, and oh, sorry. And this is uh, okay. This is the primitive cell. Uh, again, I, I, I want to make sure that we, we use always the primitive cell. And uh, this is, uh, you see, this is different from the, the standard cubic uh, unit cell. This is a primitive cell in which that is constructed using the primitive vectors of your FCC lattice. All right? Okay. So let's go ahead, and this is the, the character table for this group. This is the character table of the wave, uh, group of the wave vector at the gamma point, at k equals zero. So that's why the, the, the reducible representations are all labeled here uh, in this particular notation using the gamma, uh, Greek letter gamma. and so the first step is to find the equivalence representation you see for all for all these uh, different atoms uh, for sorry for all these different symmetry operations uh, how many atoms are uh, mapped into themselves and of course since I have only a so one sodium atom and one chlorine atom it's obvious that for all symmetry operations of the system, uh, the sodium is mapped into sodium and the chlorine is mapped into chlorine. So this is a number two for all symmetry operations of the group. Because both sodium and chlorine remain invariant for all symmetry operations of the group. And remember that you have to apply that condition that uh, if an atom is displaced to a different uh, unit cell, then it's considered equivalent. Okay, and when I decompose that into reducible representations, I, I get twice the identity representation gamma one plus. All right, and what else? Well, now I have to multiply that, make the direct product with the vector representation, right? But the vector representation you can see right here, x, y, z is a gamma 1 5 minus. So in the end, the uh, the lattice mode representation is going to be the product between the equivalence representation times the vector representation, which is gamma 1 5 minus. It's an odd odd representation under inversion as always okay and this is just twice 
gamma 1 5 minus so at the gamma point at k equals 0 I have two modes with gamma 1 5 minus symmetry okay so how do they those modes should look like well uh, from from the uh, the the discussion we, we did before uh, for the uh, uh, one dimensional case you see that one of them must be the acoustic mode right not one of them sorry three of them because I can have acoustic modes along X along Y and along Z so one of the, that uh, uh, one of the uh, gamma 1 5 minus and you see that they are triplet degenerate right so because the, the the dimensionality of the representation is 3 so they, we have two triplet degenerate modes and one of them is the uh, at omega equals 0 is the acoustic mode and the other one should be the optical mode in the in which the atoms vibrate uh, against each other and I can have three different polarizations I can have optical modes with vibrations along X along Y or along Z so I should have in principle another uh, gamma 1 5 minus mode with a frequency different than zero let's call it omega zero the frequency of the optical mode okay so what about uh, infrared and Raman activity? You see both modes uh, are odd under inversion so they should not be... Uh, the translation mode one can never see with phones but with, with, uh, with light, with photons but uh, the other, the optical mode uh, should not be Raman active because this is this is a, a, an odd mode uh, Raman modes are always even and but as you see here it transforms like the vector so this is an infrared active mode and the polarization is going to be the same as the polarization of the displacements here okay so for comparison this is the the sodium chloride the sodium chloride uh, uh, phonon dispersion and we see here that, that there is going to be three translation modes you can see that this is a triplet degenerate at, at the gamma point and this degeneracy is, is split when I go away from the gamma point but something funny is happening here at, at, uh, at the optical mode it seems there is a splitting that group theory did not predict and 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 that's what we call the LOTO splitting. This is not predicted in simple group theory just because this splitting is resulting from uh, uh, photon phonon interactions that we did not include here. So polar crystals like sodium chloride and uh, other for instance zinc blend crystals they will have LOTO splitting and uh, the splitting is larger uh, as the, 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 the crystal becomes more ionic so this we could not get from group theory but if, if we do not include this effect one would have a triply degenerate mode here and this would split into uh, LO and TO as you move away from the, from the gamma point okay and the compatibility relation uh, we can calculate or you can look up that uh, in, in compatibility relation tables is that uh, gamma 1 5 minus is split into a, a delta 1 plus a delta 5 this is one fold and this is two fold degenerate so this is a delta 5 this is a delta 1 and this is you see anti-crossing here so that's probably a delta 1 delta 1 because it has the same symmetry otherwise it would be a crossing here and uh, this is a delta 5 
double degenerate. Another way to see that you see when they get here between x in the between x and w, the degeneracy is further split. So this is a two degenerate, this one degenerate, one fold degenerate, two fold degenerate. All right, this is sodium chloride. Let let's uh, now try to calculate a more complicated structure, a perovskite structure. This this is the structure of uh, baryon titanate. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have a couple of chapters ago. We have uh, analyzed this uh, this uh, space group, this this uh, this unit cell, and it has one titanium, one barium, and three oxygen atoms per unit cell. And is again a cubic structure is the OH group, right? And uh, this is the result for the equivalence representation. Um, when I apply the identity, all atoms are invariant. A C3 axis, the C3 axis uh, goes through uh, the center and the vertex of the cube. So, of of course, barium and titanium are invariant, but you permute all the oxygen atoms, so only two atoms remain invariant here. And these are, you can go ahead and analyze all the different uh, symmetry operations, and you conclude in the end that the equivalence representation it's actually when you decompose into irreducible representations is a gamma 1 plus 3 gamma 1 plus plus gamma 1 2 plus and once again this is a cubic this is a cubic group and sorry this is a OH, so you can use the same character table as we did in the previous slide. So the equivalence representation is 3 gamma 1 plus plus gamma 1 2, sorry, gamma 1 2 plus. And I'm using the same notation as here, as in this table. So this is gamma 1, 2 plus, and this is gamma 1 plus, the identity representation, okay? All right, so let me, uh, uh, I think it's important to make this distinction. Uh, actually, if I separate equivalence representations for baryon, titanium, and oxygen, I get the following. For baryon and for titanium, I have uh, 2 gamma 1 plus, and for the three oxygen atoms, I get gamma 1 plus plus gamma 1 2 plus. So that's the important point. This gamma 1 2 plus comes from uh, the oxygen atoms. And it's important to track that correspondence when we discuss the normal modes that will be that this will be important in a minute okay all right so let's calculate the lattice modes representation this is the equivalence representation multiplied by the vector representation we have seen that before this is gamma 1 5 minus and this is 3 times gamma 1 5 minus plus the direct product between gamma 1 2 plus and gamma 1 5 minus and you can do this calculation and the result is gamma 1 5 minus plus gamma 2 5 minus <clears throat> all right so in the end the lattice mode representation is 4 times gamma 1 5 minus plus 
gamma two five minus only odd modes only odd modes so again we can say for sure that this gamma two five minus mode came from this term right from the the product between gamma one two plus and gamma one mi one five minus and this as i said i can track back to the atomic positions so i can say for sure that this mode involves only oxygen vibrations but the other modes they are mixed right because i mean they can ha have both barium titanium and oxygen vibrations and in the end since they have the same symmetry they can all mix so this is going to be harder to figure out than the mode displacements okay all right so what about well one of these modes we know is a translation so at the gamma point i have one translation mode which is gamma one five and the other modes are, are, are vibrational modes so the the acoustic mode or translation it also transforms like the vector transforms like gamma one five minus so it's it's one of the gamma one five minus modes and I have several optical modes which are three gamma one five minus plus gamma two five minus and which of them are infrared active? The infrared active modes are, again, they transform like the vector. So these are infrared active. And this is a silent mode. And we don't have any Raman active mode because none of these modes are even. Okay? <coughs> All right. So let let me analyze uh, one more time, and and now uh, w let me analyze more carefully the uh, normal modes displacements now. So uh, as I said, this is the translation. see the all atoms it's one of the translations is a translation along Z all atoms are moving in the same direction and we should have a translation along X and along uh, Y as well right okay what else so let me analyze this gamma 2 5 mode gamma 2 5 minus this is also slightly easier to analyze because, as I said before, it should involve motion of the oxygen atoms only. And why do I propose... So I, I could use the projection operators to find it, but I, I propose that this is the mode I'm looking for. Why? Because the, there's a distinction, a, a way to, to distinguish between the gamma 1,5 and gamma 2 5 minus modes is when I go back to the character table if I go back to the character table one possible way to distinguish between those two modes is by looking at the character of the C4 operation right so for for gamma 1 5 minus this is plus 1 and for gamma 2 5 minus this is minus 1 so uh, gamma to five minus it's going to be odd for a c4 rotation and gamma one five minus it's going to be even roughly speaking okay so uh, if i consider one of the c4 operations in particular if i consider a c4 z operation that is a rotation 
of C4 of, of, of 90 degrees along the, the Z axis. So uh, you see that this particular mode that I chose here in which the atom 1 along X and atom 2 along Y they vibrate in opposition of phase you see that this is uh, is satisfied this is a good guess right it's a good guess for a gamma 2 5 minus mode All right and the atom 3 remains unmoved uh, unchanged uh, it doesn't move so and you see that i can construct two modes actually, sorry three modes like that one mode is what i could call uh, x2 sorry This is a mode that I, I, I could call this is this is polarized along Z, right? So I, I this this involves a displacement along Z with opposite signs between atom two and atom one, right? So this mode I could call uh, 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 Z two minus Z1 and it's reasonable you see if I if I do the same for a mode uh, uh, this is a mode in which the atoms vibrate along Z if I find a mode in which the atoms are vibrate along X then I should have no displacement in atom 1 and opposite displacements in atom two and three. So a, a second, a second uh, partner of this uh, this mode should be uh, uh, x three minus x two. And finally, the third partner should be y one minus y three. So these are the three modes that I should expect based on this simple ground. All right, so uh, we are going to confirm in a minute that they transform like uh, a C4, under a C4Z operation with the, the correct character. Uh, let me go into that with, in more detail in a minute. But before that, let me, you see, first of all, notice that this is a gamma 1, 5. The translation mode is a gamma 1, 5 minus mode. And you see that in this case, precisely, when you rotate around C4, around the z-axis by 90 degrees, you, you have the two arrows pointing in the same direction, right? Uh, so uh, this is an this is a even mode under C4 rotation. Okay, so how could I guess the other modes? So let's take this guy here. Uh, so in, in this case, atoms one, oxygen atoms one and two are moving in opposition of phase, and atom three is not moving. So let's consider the possibility in all the oxygen atoms are moving in the same direction. So this is a, a good starting point because surely it's going to be orthogonal to this mode. It, uh, it has a chance right, to be orthogonal to this mode because this has plus, plus, minus, minus. This is minus, 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 minus. So it's, it's going to be orthogonal. But uh, in order to satisfy the condition that the center of mass do, do not, does not move, I must have, for instance, the titanium atom. Uh, moving upwards, so this is a this is a, a possibility for a gamma one five mode, right? Uh, it's certainly a, a vibrational mode in which the center of mass do, do, does not move, and it's orthogonal to this gamma two five minus mode. So that's a, another good guess. So what else? So let's. Consider now the possibility of another mode that it's orthogonal to this one in which I can have 
all the oxygen atoms moving in the same direction and also the titanium atom moving in the same direction this should be also, also orthogonal to both of these two modes but to do that and to make the center of mass uh, uh, to, to, to subtract out the movement of the center of mass then the barium atoms should move in the opposite direction right so this is a good guess for gamma 1 5 minus mode as well and finally this is harder to guess but again you, you, you if you think about it this is another possibility the all only the oxygen atoms move but uh, for this particular mode uh, polarized along Z the atoms along Z move in one direction and the atoms along X and Y move in the opposite direction and uh, and to make this uh, the center of mass of these guys uh, um, changed I must uh, actually have twice as much displacement in the in the Z coordinate than in the X Y coordinate this should be uh, twice 2Z3 minus Z1 minus Z2 right and similarly for, for other modes polarized along different for the X and Y direction. So these are only these are only three partners, Z partners, gamma 1, 5, Z. You see the displacements of all these modes are along Z, gamma 1, 5 minus Z, gamma 1, 5 minus Z, and I should have corresponding X and Y polarized modes. Okay, but again, this is a uh, these modes they can mix because they have the same symmetry, so they could have hybridize. So these are our possible choices of these modes. So let me uh, uh, show you that these uh, uh, different modes they have. Um, they transform under the, the C4Z operation uh, in the way uh, they should, right? And let me do that for this gamma 2, 5 minus mode, which is this one. And for the, 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 the latest, the last gamma 1, 5 minus mode that uh, I consider, which is this one in the previous slide and so what I'm going to do now is see how I can use it I can pick a particular symmetry operation which is C4Z and see how did these modes transform into themselves when I apply C4Z and let me this is a, just a check let's check if they transform the way they should do in give me giving me the correct a character uh, in each case so in general what I can say well let let me consider this particular oper operation C4Z and I can just look at the geometry here and I can say that when I apply C4Z to the set of three atoms one two three labeled in this particular manner one two three you can see that I swap 1 and 2 and 3 is kept uh, invariant, right? So this is one, a 2, 1, 3. Okay? So what about the Cartesian coordinates? What happened to them? So what happens when I, ap I apply C4Z to the coordinates X, Y, and Z? I can see that uh, Z remains unchanged and Y goes into X and X goes into minus Y and Z remains unchanged. So this is the result of, of that uh, application of C4, C4Z, right? So 
Okay, so let's apply that to the, uh, to the three modes that we have considered uh, before. So in this case, you see this is one of them, but I had three, I have, this is the one polarized along Z, but I had modes polarized along X and Y, and I, if I apply C4Z to the set of three modes, minus X2 plus X3, this is the one polarized along Z, Y1 minus Y3, and minus Z1 plus Z2. I got this from the previous slide. And now I'm going to apply these rules. Whenever there is a 2, I swap with 1 and vice versa. Whenever there is a 3, I keep that unchanged. And whenever there is an X, I, I put minus, I put Y. Whenever there is a Y, I put minus X, and Z remains unchanged. When I do that, you see that the result is minus Y1 plus Y3 minus X2 plus X3 minus Z2 plus Z1. And I can write that as a 3 by 3 matrix multiplied by the original vector. And this 3 by 3 matrix multiplied by the original vector minus x2 plus x3. You can check that later. It's simply is simply that I swap 1 and 2 and I, I apply a minus sign in one of them and uh, and this is minus 1 C2, yeah, so I swapped 1 and 2 so I got a minus sign here right so in this basis this is the matrix representation of C4Z and that's the meaning of that and now I can calculate the character the character is just a trace and you see that the character for C4V C4Z is minus 1 and this is what I should expect for the gamma 2 5 minus mode right as I said here for the gamma 2 5 minus mode the character for C4 is minus 1 Okay, let's see now if I if the character for gamma 1 5 is plus 1. And let me use the sensible guess that I, I did in the previous slide. And uh, for this particular mode, let's apply C4Z to 2x1 to minus x2 minus x3 minus y1 plus 2y2 minus y3 and minus z1 minus z2 plus 2z3 so these are the three modes that uh, I can construct from from uh, applying this is the the z the z polarized one and these are the other X and Y polarized modes, and I apply the same rules, I get so I swap one and two and keep three unchanged and swap y and x with a minus sign for one of them and in the end I get twi twice y2 minus y1 minus y3 x2 minus 2x1 plus x3 minus z2 
minus z1 plus 2 z3 and you can see that this is just another matrix 0 1 0 minus 1 0 1 and this mode you see it remains unchanged you get 0 0 0 1 on the original on the original mode and you see the character here is one so this is looking good of course you should you don't have to test for all symmetry operations uh, you can use some common sense and and is verify that this should be a good mode but uh, the straightforward way to to go is to apply the projection operator but in most cases you don't really need to do that all right very good so let's do uh, another example here which is uh, phonons in a non-symorphic structure in this case the diamond diamond structure okay diamond structure we, we again have seen a lot in the previous uh, uh, lecture this is a picture of the diamond structure uh, in this if this is a diamond or a silicon all the atoms should have the same type and in both sublattices they should be both silicon and or both uh, germanium or tin uh, and if you remember there is uh, uh, it's a non-symorphic group and for in which some of the symmetry operations they have to be compound with a, a, a translation by tau in which tau is uh, a translation by this vector right we have seen that many times and as a matter of fact uh, I can actually tell you that uh, the symmetry operations which I have to uh, combine with tau are precisely this one this one and uh, the inversion this one and this one these are the symmetry operations that I have to combine with tau and that's uh, that's the only thing I need to know to find what is the equivalence the characters for the equivalence representation because, because whenever I don't have a translation then both germanium atoms are invariant so there is a 2 here 2 here and whenever there is a translation uh, then they are mapped into the opposite sublattice so the interchange position so this is a 0 0 2 0 0 and we have seen we have done that in the previous lecture I think and this is the equivalence representation and this is actually gamma 1 plus gamma 2 prime using this notation here now this is slightly different notation the book uses both notations okay so what is the lattice mode representation is the direct product between that and the vector and you see the vector here in this notation is gamma 1 5 so this is the direct product between gamma 1 and plus gamma 2 prime plus gamma uh, times gamma 1 5 and this is gamma 1 5 plus gamma 2 5 uh, prime right 
And this is straightforward because we know that this must be the translations or acoustic mode. And so, of course, this should be the threefold degenerate optical modes. All right, so what about the infrared and Raman? Uh, in this case, you see that the, the vibration modes, which is this one, uh, it's even, right? It's an even under inversion mode, gamma to five prime. And so there's a chance it's Raman active, and indeed, you can see from the, the basis functions here that it is Raman active for perpendicular polarization, okay? All right, very good. And um, let me just go back here because I have uh, this picture of the uh, the phonon dispersion of Germanian that precisely shows that the gamma 1.5 translation and the gamma 2.5 prime optical mold here and this is a Raman active mold of Germanium or silicon okay since this is not a polar crystal it doesn't have any LOTO splitting only when I move away from the gamma point the LO and TO are split. Uh, in the gamma point, at the gamma point, they are threefold degenerate. Okay, what about the mode displacements? So, uh, this is, is, again, a little bit, it's kind of easy to figure out. Let me uh, draw this as my X axis. This is, should be my Y axis, and this is my Z axis. Oops. And I should have displacements along X, Y, and Z. For if I want to draw a mode in polarized along X, then I think uh, this should be a, 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 a good choice. I, I make displacements of all atoms in one of the sublattices along the same direction. So all the black atoms move along positive X. I will not draw all of them. And I make opposite displacements in atoms for the, op for the other sublattice. So all the open ball atoms move in the minus x direction, okay? So if I call this atom 1 and this one atom 2 in my unit cell, uh, the, this mode should be x1 minus x2, right? And, uh, of course, the other polarizations should give me Y1 minus Y2, Z1 minus Z2. Okay? <coughs> Very nice. So, I should now do the same. So, this is the gamma 2, 5 prime mode. Um... I should uh, do the same exercise here and try to uh, uh, confirm that by applying uh, the C4Z operation. And uh, I think I'm going to do that right here. So for for the C4Z, it's a, it, it's a uh, 
screw axis operation. So I have to combine that with translation by tau. So this is just an example to so that we get used to working with this anosimorphic group with a screw axis operation. So when I apply this to atoms 1 and 2, I exchange sublattices. I get 2 and 1. Right? And also, when I apply this compound operation, combined operation, to coordinates x, y, z, this is a C4, right? So this is, as before, y minus x, z. Okay. So why am I doing that? I'm just want I just want to check if this gamma two five minus mode it's odd. It has a minus one character for the C four Z operation. Okay. So let's do that uh, here. So let me now. Let me now apply this combined operation to this vector of the combined uh, three basis functions x1 minus x2, y1 minus y2, z1 minus z2. And I use these rules. I swap one and two, and uh, okay. I swap uh, x with minus y, and uh, y for x and z for z. Right. So I get y two minus y one minus x two plus x one and uh, z2 minus z1 and you see that uh, you see that the the representation for this operation c4 z tau is a 3 by 3 matrix 0 minus 1 0 1 0 0 0 0, 0 1 minus 1 sorry and as expected, the character is going to be minus one. So this is a, a good guess for this optical mode, for this set of three vectors. All right, let me now just uh, see again. This is the, see the silicon, I think it's silicon uh, uh, phonon dispersion, similar to Germanium. Um, this is just to show you the character, the, the compatibility relations, uh, gamma one five minus, which is the translation mode. Goes into delta five plus delta one. And this is precisely what you see here, delta five, delta one, and. Gamma, so this is gamma one five minus. This is gamma two five minus. Gamma two five prime, which is, yeah. So this is a, a different notation. So this is gamma two five plus. Right in uh, in the the other notation, and this is confusing too, using two different notations. But I mean, the book uses that all the time. So gamma two five plus is is uh, gamma five. Sorry, delta five plus delta two prime. This is a the decomposition along delta went from from the gamma two five plus mode. All right. 
These are the phonon dispersions and compatibility relations in silicon. And finally, uh, let me briefly discuss the case of uh, zinc band structure. For instance, gallium arsenide is a, is a similar structure as the as the, the diamond lattice, but in this case, I have two different atomic species in sublattices one and two. Uh, one example is gallium arsenide, so it's a smaller symmetry group. It's a it's not OH anymore. It's a TD, the tetrahedral group. It's still cubic, but the this the this motif, the different motif, reduces its symmetry. It doesn't have 48 symmetry operations anymore. It has only <coughs> 24, and it's a symorphic group. It doesn't have any translation. Right, and and these are the the character table, and what is the equivalence representation? Of course, it's it's going to be the characters are going to be two for all operations because we have two different atoms. They should map into themselves for all symmetry operations, and and this is a two times a one. Uh, in the other notation, it, it, 2 times gamma 1. This is a totally symmetric representation. What is the lattice mode representation? Is multiply that, make the direct product with the vector, and it's ca this case is T2. And then I get two T2 modes. Right, and once again, one should be the translation mode, and the other one should be uh, an optical mode. So one is is uh, acoustic, and the other one is optical. So what are the uh, infrared and Raman activity? Actually, there's a mistake here. I think I have said that before. X, Y, X, Z, and Y, Z basis functions they belong to T2. So T2 is both the optical T2 mode is both infrared and Raman active. And it's Raman active for perpendicular polarization. Okay? This is gallium arsenic. And I think this is it for today, and I thank you for your attention.